Yeah, like, yeah. Have to breathe a little bit. Yeah. Do you use the internet? No. I need to do one on TNCs or something. I'm doing the TNC which is taxi in the two cities. Okay, everybody who's in here now is just like a complete transit nerd, and there's just no way <laughs> around it because um, no one subjects themselves voluntarily to this kind of dream. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was in uh, I was in Sacramento yesterday, and uh, the ash from the fires was really, really intense. And then I had like this really, really invasive eye exam today. So my eyes are like. So if you see me like like closing my eyes, it's not because I'm like. Drifting off and bored, but I don't know when I felt my eyes so trash. So I, uh, I hope they don't look as bad as they feel. Uh, okay, so I blew it. I'm sorry. I thought I was just going to finish about on time. So uh, Mike started uh, yesterday on uh, shared economy and shared mobility. This is the last of the stuff on transit. I'm going to talk about transit service planning. And we had just gone through right-of-way types, and I just started into that. So there's basically exclusive, semi-exclusive, and mixed traffic, and that's really the important thing, and I've kind of said this again and again. People keep talking about rubber tires and steel wheels, and people need rail, and they don't like buses, but a lot of what we're really talking about is, is rights-of-way. Um, so the exclusive rights-of-way are, uh, are typically heavy rail, What was that? It's on my screen. That was weird. It was just maybe it was because I was blinking. Oh, there's a different star again. What did it have? I don't know. Just get out and get back in. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, is, is heavy rail, and I mention this because uh, it's often powered by a third rail, and uh, you can be uh, you know, badly electrocuted from that. Commuter rail can be exclusive right away, but it can cross at grade, right? So we, we were on, we, Metrolink we visited, that's commuter rail, right? And um, so it can operate exclusive, but it can cross at grade, and, and that sort of would actually be more uh, could also be in the, uh, what I call semi-exclusive. And uh, these are big projects. Uh, you tend to have boarding at stations only. You tend to have high-level platforms. You don't climb up to them. And uh, you have payment affairs off the, the vehicle. Now, as you know, some commuter rail, you can pay on vehicle. You typically pay a premium for that. So then, um, uh, this, the semi-exclusive is kind of what we're seeing more and more uh, uh, so we can have commuter rail there as well, like the Orange Line busway if you've been on it. It's exclusive, but it crosses the grade, right? So there's people that, that cross with that. Uh, a, a lot of BRT around the world is on this sort. Uh, the BRT, what we call BRT in LA typically is not. It's sort of skip-stop service that has a few other features of BRT, what I've called in some papers BRT light. Um, and often the argument for BRT is you gradually upgraded it, and you can have some really high capacity uh, BRT lines. Uh, so, and I think I have a picture later, uh, like the Inso Entes line in Mexico City has just a tremendous capacity, operates on like 90 second headways uh, with big double articulated buses. It's, it's really high, high capacity. So you have mostly physical separation from auto and really for, for transit, being able to do that in, in spots, being able to find bottlenecks and have, have separation can be really, really important. Uh, it tends to have at grade uh, crossings. You still have boarding, boarding and platforms. They can be either at grade or, or climb up. So on the Orange Line busway, you typically uh, you climb up to it, I believe. You climb up under the bus, and others that you'll have that at, at plat platform. And then uh, uh, finally, the local service, and this was the, I gave you the, the apartment and roommate theory of all of this, remember? So this is uh, mixed traffic, the costs tend to be lower, and you can do light rail in mixed traffic. And often, 
that's where I think a big mistake is made where public officials will say, oh yeah, rail, 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 we really like right, light rail, we don't have the money to pay for exclusive right of way, we'll buy some cars, we'll run tracks down the middle of the street, why hasn't ridership taken off? Well, operationally, it's just a higher capacity vehicle that's still stuck in traffic uh, as, as, um, uh, as it would be with a bus. And in San Francisco, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of light rail that operates at street level in mixed traffic. Um, and it, it has the advantage of higher capacity, but it has the same problem. So if you've ever ridden like the, the N. Judah or the, you know, the, the M. Ocean View, the K. Angle side, Somebody double parks to deliver something, and everybody stops because you can't move around it. So it's got the same sorts of issues. So that's why I really want to emphasize kind of right away as opposed to technology. Um, so when you're designing a transit line, most people think, okay, well it's the line, and then I'm done. You know, job done. I'm all done. But the stops and stop placement and how you make decisions about that is really important kind of what you might do to enhance the service in a different way, and I'll give some examples of that. What kind of vehicles you use. Um, and then I'm gonna just give you a little overview of scheduling, and uh, we've talked about performance monitoring at more of a system-wide level, and I'll talk a little bit about that at a, at a service level. So again, I was showing you those, remember the last time we talked, I showed you those, all those different types. Generally, there's radial crosstown, circumferential crosstown which is kind of the, the arc or the beltway sort of lines. Uh, neighborhood service, which Jarrett Walker and, and many um, self-respecting planners just hate neighborhood shuttles and things like that. Elected officials like them. They'll say, uh, we had a public hearing and people wish there was a bus here, can't you run it here? But those neighborhood shuttles don't tend to fit into a network and it's really the way that things tie into the network. Um, what they call circulator and other kinds of shuttles. So common thing will be, We've got an office park out in the suburbs. We have a rail line that goes nearby. We'll run a shuttle back and forth. Why are so few people using that? Well, there's usually two reasons. One is they have to make a second transfer, and we know that's, that's not a good thing. And they often have to work their way through a parking lot to get there where there's free parking. So those are things that will get in the way of that. Adding that extra transfer is not as good. Being able to get the, the network itself to interact with the ideal uh, origins and destinations is most important. Um, so here are some local examples of these different kinds of service. So the MTA 20 line on Wilshire Boulevard, I don't know if uh, any of these ha have been up. I did this a few years ago. I think they're all still accurate. Um, sort of limited stop or express service, and I'll talk about that. It's not necessarily the same as BRT, and I have some graphics that will show you that. Uh, the LA Dash, the Boyle Heights route, for example, that's this kind of feeders, circulators, and distributors. And I know the folks at, at LA DOT have tried to get rid of some of these lines. They're very popular, again, with elected officials. Loops, which is the, the, uh, the Dash Vermont main line that kind of circles around a loop. Uh, bus Rapid Transit, so MTA Orange Line would be the, the high end uh, BRT that we have in LA. Uh, park and Ride, uh, commuter shuttle uh, uh, service would be something like the LA DOT 419 because it actually has a park and ride lot. So the 431 comes here to Westwood, right? But it doesn't have a, a big parking and ride lot at the end. Yes? I'm confused the difference between the, the former slide and the slide. You're saying those are type, the former types of lines? Yeah, and it's just give me an example here in LA if you're familiar with those so you can get an idea of, of what it is. I just described them and then I'm saying here's some local examples. So the there's no difference between line and route type because they're the ones that line type and this says route. So yeah, line that? type and route type I'm treating as the same. Okay. okay. Um, and then like a zone service is where um, I think I talked about in, in Houston, they tried to um, have areas that were not easily served. They had a lot of, of uh, circuitous streets to be able to just call and get dial a ride and come down to the station. Uh, and then there's, there's what this is called flex route or deviated fixed route. There are some areas, we don't have much of it in, in the US, but there'll be areas where um, in the central city, you'll have regular stops, but as it gets out farther and farther, sometimes they'll work out to another town. You can have some flexibility to say, I live a block off the route, and it'll deviate over and, and drop you off. It's typically for the, for the drop off. You walk to the main street to get on. And that's usually where you'll have really crowded, uh, you get into an outlying area and they can just drop you off. Uh, 
So they'll have a limit to how far, it's called limited root deviation service. So here's some examples of what they, they look like. So this is just a local, you stop at every stop. Uh, uh, this went on for a long time. Then when, when, when transit use started to decline, you were stopping at every stop you didn't need to. The pull cord came into to being. So now what it is is you'll go by stops and it's allowed transit operators to have a lot of stops. As I mentioned, if you don't have heavy ridership, it can be very efficient because you can drop people off and pick them up very close to their origins and destinations. When you have heavy ridership, and I give you that example of Honolulu, you're dropping, you know, every block or two you're stopping, and so it really slows uh, through your cycle times. Um, so this gives a look at, uh, a limited stop service looks like this. So a lot of BRT service would be like this, where you go every, every three or four stops and you go through. How many of you have taken a local to a BRT stop and then transferred to it? Have you done that? I've done it once. I always have this debate, is it worth getting off? <laughs> and you usually you save time, but it's more hassle, which really goes again to the, to the transferring. So a perfect example, you're headed you know, downtown or something like that, and you get off that local. And then I think, well, is it worth just walking up to the, there's these, these dilemmas about that. And then express service, um, these are like freeway flyers, and they, they, this exists in San Francisco as well, where it'll do local service out in an outlying area, then it, it actually doesn't pick up any more people and will travel into the central business district. So those are kind of three basic ways that the, the service can be laid out. Okay, so what are some of the design considerations? We talked about the service design policies. Remember I talked about that at the outset? Um, what your connections are to other modes, lines, and other operators. Um, how you think about major traffic generators. Um, Intermodal facilities, so if you're going to connect to airports or, or train stations, what the right-of-way and, and street situation is. And often, this is a really big constraint, because you may have, for example, you know, uh, LMU, Loyola Marymount, if you know that. So it's actually off of, of uh, Westchester Boulevard, and it's in a neighborhood, and it makes it difficult for transit agencies to kind of work their way through residential streets, they, they, the, the, the vehicles will be too heavy, the corners are too sharp, the neighbors oppose it, and it can actually be difficult to get into a major trip generator. Um, what the topography is, um, there can be places, and there are in LA, where the, the hills are just too steep for certain kinds of, of equipment to move up and down. And it's one reason that you see a lot of, uh, of, um, of trolley buses in San Francisco, because of their capacity to accelerate uh, in very hilly situations. And then how much auto traffic you have. One debate in transit is, do you move off onto a parallel corridor that has lower levels of auto traffic because you can have faster through, through speeds? But usually that other corridor is crowded for a reason, that more of the, the major trip generators and attractors are there, right? So if you stay on there and crawl along through traffic, what the transition would like to do is what? What would they like to do? They want an excuse of bus lane, right? And they're usually not able to get it. So do you do you move off because of auto traffic? And then other overall patterns in the area. Let me see if there's anything else I'm going to say about this. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah. The, the right of way, or the, the like, like a bus only lane. Um, how, are those enforced? Are they well? Are they enforced? Yeah, they're they're enforced. It's a it's a. Um, Enforcement is an issue, I mean, what you want to do uh, with almost any kind of enforcement is to make the pain of being caught and the probability of being caught, uh, sort of the, the sum of that, discourage you from, from engaging in the behavior that you, don't, you, you want to avoid. And so a lot, of, a lot of criminal law and things are based on this idea of, well, if the punishment is great enough, and I think the probability of getting caught is high enough, uh, am I going to engage in behavior? There's a big debate now about, about tax policy. There's been a lot of cut in auditing, and the chances of being caught cheating on your taxes has gone down a lot. And they, they, they're concerned that there's a big increase in people sort of lying on their taxes because they think the odds of getting caught are pretty low. I think that bus-only lanes are a lot like income taxes today. Is uh, they will have, and transit agencies will get frustrated when they have a lot of people who are, are, are cheating and going into those lanes. And they'll push, sometimes they'll do a big law enforcement push where they'll come out 
and they'll ticket a bunch of people over and over again with the idea that, that if, if, if there's a whole wave of people who get ticketed, they'll start to modify their behavior. But there is a dilemma generally in having to enforce that. Um, this is a huge issue. I just did a little bit of work a, a few years ago uh, with folks in Ahmedabad, India, and they were doing a BRT system where they were doing exclusive right-of-way. And the streets are so crowded and congested that, empty, that, that right-of-way was so attractive that people would do all sorts of things. They would basically, they'd have a little, little kind of low wall and they'd pull their motorcycle over and get it into the right-of-way and then zip down. And so they were having to put a lot of effort into enforcement, having to build things up higher and higher uh, to try and deal with the fact that you had this incredibly attractive thing, which was this open, clear right-of-way in a, in a really busy city. So it is a sort of issue. Um, traffic generators, there's a lot that's done in travel demand modeling that looks at traffic impact analysis. Is a traffic generator for, that we do for that the same as a traffic generator for transit? Why not? Some of the, um, the traffic that's generated from these specific uses for car or for cars aren't like uh, applicable to transit. So for example, like a, a construction site, um, the workers at the construction site might need to bring their tools with them and other sorts of equipment and aren't going to be the best transit riders. Like they're not applicable transit riders because of that, because they have to haul stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and a good example, even know I know where you used to work, is the uh, across the street, the Home Depot on Jefferson Boulevard. Well, that generates a lot of traffic. So it's a big Home Depot in West LA, parking lot's often full, but there aren't a lot of people who take transit to and from the Home Depot. Some of the workers may, but if you're, you know, if you're buying a toilet and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, a shower door, you don't typically then get back on the, on the bus. So that would generate a lot of vehicle traffic, or the example you gave, but not so much. And there might be other things. So uh, a place where parking is difficult or expensive, so a junior college, a high school, may not generate a lot of traffic for how many people are there, but may generate a lot of, of transit use. So the, the key thing is to think about sort of, it's a, it's a combination of sort of the density of activity, but also the probability of transit use in that. So, I, you know, I was just coming to carpooling to campus today, and, um, uh, just looking at, at, at Westwood and, uh, and Hillgard, and at one point in that intersection, I, could, I counted nine buses. Just, I mean, the amount of bus traffic is just enormous uh, because, you know, we've got a population here during the school year of uh, 411 acres with over 60,000 people. That's a lot of potential transit users and expensive parking that's limited in some way. Did, yeah? Uh, so I have a question about like of waste. So it's like, so if there is an intersection, the one street has a light of way for the BLP, but one another street, another street intersecting with the law does not have light of way. So in this case, it's like so. For example, in a Mexico City, it's like I used to use a BLP in Mexico City, and there is a big intersection, and Isohentis has a light of way, but another street crossing uh, across uh, Isohentis does not have a light of way. So, yeah. so there are so many vehicles waiting in the light of way that is like in the on the street of another street, not in Sohentis. And it's like blocking the BLP and the BLP delays. So in this case, intersection, we can say the intersection has to um, has a, BL, a no, light of way for BLP or it's like an intersection is exceptional. Yeah, so there's, there's two comments on that. One is um, in general, in highly congested places, people will try and push and be the last person through the intersection. Mm -hmm. And be honest, we've all been impatient at some point. Because sometimes I think, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, I'm feeling a little guilty. But because the rule is, what's the, the what's the DMV rule in the U.S.? Good. Is that you're not to enter the intersection unless you have a reasonable expectation that you can clear it. And that doesn't mean I want to get into the intersection before the light changes to yellow so that I can kind of wait in line to work my, work my way through. Um, and so related to traffic condition, because that's where you can actually, the, it's, as an aside, people use the term gridlock all the time. They use that to mean heavy traffic. It's not what it means. But there's a certain thing where you can show, essentially mathematically, you can have a network. And if these folks block and it blocks with that intersection and blocks those people, you can actually be in a situation where no one can move. And it's the, 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 the grid is essentially locked. Mm -hmm. And so the way they do that is they'll also have waves of enforcement that you can go through. And that, that's, a, that's a big issue about how you manage traffic and 
in a place like Mexico City, where you have so much population, so much density, um, that if, if people enter the intersection without a reasonable expectation to clear it, the light changes, they're stuck, then of course it locks up the line and you're, and you're lost on that. So a main issue, and it happens here in LA too, is that you have to, you, you have, to have enforcement in some way. And people have to have a reasonable expectation they can get caught and ticketed. They were having an effect, they were doing more photo enforcement, that was really unpopular, so they cut back a lot on that. And then a second issue, I think they've mentioned, is that you can also have signal preemption, and they can do that in a couple of ways. One is um, uh, sort of the way, in, in, in some emergency vehicles have it where it's really like, like you know, parting the sea and going through it, that they can do emergency vehicles now where it will change the, it will change the signal phasing so they get greens everywhere. Which is the, if you ever watched the Italian job, they kind of played with that and did that. Uh, so it, had, it had traffic stuff in it. But, um, so so uh, you can do that. Uh, traffic engineers understandably hate that because it can be really disruptive. Because you're basically moving platoons of cars through and you want to you uh, sort of weave them in. And when you do it efficiently, you can maximize the, minimize the delay in movement of cars. When an emergency vehicle comes through, it disrupts all that. And when it, it, it changes the lights and gets them out of phasing, then you have people backing up through intersections, all sorts of things uh, cascade and create problems. Okay, so there are a couple ways around that. They have what they call sort of limited or uh, sort of partial signal preemption, which means that, uh, and they have that some on, I believe, the Wilshire line, where as you approach the intersection, uh, if it's green and it's about to change to red and it senses the vehicle's there, it will hold it green for an extra few seconds. So actually, if you're driving along, following a, a rapid is a good thing to do because <laughs> you're likely to hit a lot of greens. Now, if, if it doesn't work with the phasing and there's a large platoon of cars waiting and they're ready to go, they won't just hold it green. Eventually, they'll have to stop at the light. But you, you hit the green more often on, on, on the rapid. On, on certain boulevards. And it's sort of working within the logic of managing all of the vehicles, but it gives, it gives an advantage to transit, and, and that's been pretty positive. And then I mentioned before, the last thing is, is you can have, again, uh, we don't have that, I don't think, anywhere in LA. And I've seen it in Europe and, I forget where else, maybe in, in, in Brisbane, Australia, I think, where the, the bus comes up and it comes up and it has, a, almost it looks like a bike lane, they pull over into its own lane. There's uh, one that they just installed in Berkeley on uh, First Avenue. Oh, okay. Yeah. For AC? Uh, for AC Transit. Yeah. yeah. It's been extremely successful. So it comes up to the light, then it gets a green, says bus only. It takes off, and all it needs is three seconds, really. It doesn't need much. It just means that it gets out in front of, of everyone else, and the light changes, and so it'll get that as well. But if they're not doing the, the enforcement, you can have that whole setup, give it the green, and if that car is blocking it, it's the, it's the same problem. So. Yes? Sorry, could you just explain again this, um, this kind of like signal preemption, the, this example in, in Berkeley and how that works on the street? I well, there's two different things. So, so the, the signal preemption, uh, so, so there's, there's, there's kind of absolute signal preemption, which is uh, I'm a, 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 you know, a police car or a, a, a paramedics, and I turn on, and what it does is it just automatically flips things to green. But again, that's really disruptive. What this does is it, um, it will, uh, if the bus is waiting at the light, it will actually switch to green a few seconds sooner. And when the bus, uh, so, so uh, say, say it's sitting at the light and it's, it's number two in the queue, and it senses that a, that a rapid is there, it, instead of waiting the full, say, 45 seconds, at 40 seconds, it will go to green. So it shortens the other, the other street a little bit to get that rapid moving through. And then it makes up for it at the next signal phase to get it back into line. Or if it's opposing and it's about to get a yellow light, it will hold it for an extra five seconds. And then the bus gets through, then it, as soon as the bus hits it, and you can see it, sometimes I've done that where I've followed, I have to be careful, I'm, you know, trying to explain. No, I'm really interested. <laughs> but it'll go through and, and you'll see as rapid enters, a lot of times you'll get a yellow right away. Because it was then you know it's holding that signal for it. So uh, you have five seconds here, five seconds there, but if you start to do that over the whole length, it can, it can add up. Now, if congestion becomes so bad, it, th these kinds of improvements won't, won't make any difference, but, but it can do that. 
Anything else? I think that's what I wanted to suggest Can there. I ask one thing about the uh, on the topic of traffic generators. Mm -hmm. um, when you're and you were talking about versus like transit use, the yeah, same thing. So well, what's the difference between a, a a trip generator and a trip attraction? That's a that's a good question. So. Um, uh, basically, the term is, is it, it refers to whether people are, originate their trip somewhere or end it. So um, in, the, in the morning, UCLA is a trip attractor. In the afternoon, it's a trip generator. Generally, we refer to homes and houses and apartments as being trip generators and sort of places of employment and retail as trip attractors. So they can use it in both ways. But, but there's... Uh, the, the, way they'll, the way they'll use to describe it in, in travel demand modeling, which is taught in the, in the third, is to say uh, a trip generation is a desire to engage in some activity, right? So I'm going to make a trip. I'm going to go out to eat with friends. I'm going to go to a movie. You're going to go somewhere to a movie. You're going to go somewhere out to eat. But you haven't determined where is it, the movie playing? Is this place cheaper than that one? Do I like this restaurant? My friend doesn't like this kind of food. You work it out. So you make a decision to go out to eat and make a decision to go to the movies. Then you decide on that, and so the attraction is sort of that decision to make a trip, yeah. and the gen and the and the uh, oh, excuse me, the generation is to make the trip. The attraction is sort of where you decide to go to fulfill that desire for an activity, and that's how it's conceived of in travel demand modeling, right? So there's the two part, and one usually comes before the other. I'm hungry, I'm bored. Let's go to eat and go to a movie. Uh, where should we go? And that's a secondary decision. So in that sense, if you're coming from home, the trip generator is home? If you're coming from home, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the role of the line in the system, we talked about that, whether it's a, I, I've been through that enough, the core line, something like that. Okay, some other things to think about. Simpler is usually better. And if you've been reading Jarrett Walker, you've been getting uh, that. But uh, can the street handle the weight of the bus? And how do we determine weight? Yeah, so we have things that, uh, the buses are different because they're heavier when they're full of people than when they're empty, and it's typically on the axle load. So it isn't the gross weight of the vehicle. And a lot of our rules are on the gross weight of the vehicle, but it depends on how many axles. So the, the, the weight is distributed over the axles. So uh, buses will not weigh as much as, say, uh, big trucks, but they'll tend to only have two axles and sometimes three, where large trucks can have many, many more, right? Um, distribute that. People who don't want to do damage to roads want to have a lot of axles on trucks. And there's some that carry very heavy things that they, have you ever seen them where there's just one set of wheels after another? It's to distribute up because it's at whatever point that the, that the pressure is down. However, what's the downside of all those axles? Yeah. Um, it adds more weight and makes it a little bit harder to turn? Well, it does make it harder to turn. It does add a little bit of weight. It increases rolling resistance and reduces mileage, increases emissions. So you want as few, well, if you've ever ridden a road bike, right, what is it? It's really high air pressure and really thin tires. Uh, if you want to have good grip, you have your big, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, off-road bike, but it has a lot more rolling resistance, and so that's the sort of trade-off. So this can be an issue and if you don't have a problem with that uh, if you don't handle that you can do a lot of damage to the roadway uh, with these vehicles uh, in particular buses will sit and hold for a long time on just uh, at a stop and have you ever have you ever noticed that you'll see it'll be asphalt concrete and then it'll be portland cement concrete at the stop it's called a bus pad you ever notice that in in some areas that'll be for a street that was paved at a light for a lighter load and because buses sit there for a long time and can put a lot of downward pressure on, the, on that spot, they'll create a Portland uh, a cement concrete pad so that the bus sits there, it's able to withstand uh, a higher load. So a lot of times, in, you know, we don't get into that if you do this assignment uh, related to this, we don't go and check all the, the, the streets, and, and, but many have been frustrated by saying, oh, this will be perfect, we'll turn down here. Well, turns out that you know, whatever street can't handle that kind of a vehicle. Um, you have to consider the turning radii of a bus. 
Uh, one of the most humbling experiences I ever had was, was judging at a, at a bus rodeo. <laughs> Do any of you know what a bus rodeo is? Everyone? It's a, do you know what a rodeo is? You do? Okay. Uh, it's basically a contest where the bus drivers uh, have to perform tricks, essentially, uh, of skill with the buses. And it was a really good experience for, for me because the, um, it was in the Bay Area, had bus drivers from all of the operators who came there, and they came with their buses, and they're all there cheering. I got to be a judge. And... Um, the muni drivers have to be driving these big buses down narrow, steep streets, day in and day out, and their skill levels were amazing, amazing. And so they would, there was this one driver who would come up, he'd come at like 60 miles an hour and like turn it sideways and he'd go, Rawr! and he'd be skidding and he'd go right between cones with like inches to spare without ever knocking one of the cones over. And the other drivers would knock them all over. I mean, it, you know, he was driving it like he was driving a Porsche with this. It was unbelievable. And, and he was just, had been doing it for 30 years and could, could handle it. There is an irony, I don't know if I, I mentioned, we talked a little bit about labor, is that when you do the, the uh, when you do the bids on the runs, oh, you might've heard me ask that at the, uh, where, where's that driver driving? On the easiest route. Because yeah, he's been there the longest. And the rookies, where are they driving? They're driving the number 30 Stockton through Chinatown. And it's kind of the opposite. I've always thought what they should do is reward that driver because you get, essentially you get a premium for driving the really, you know, I'm sure driving Wilshire Boulevard and getting up into Westwood and things like that is a lot tougher than driving out in the San Fernando Valley. And uh, the driver should be rewarded for that in some way. But, um, so you have to consider the radii. And what will happen is it'll work it out and uh, you can't get around there. This gets into a uh, uh, conflict with complete streets, folks, because they want to push the, 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 the sidewalk out, they want to push the curves out, things like that. Well, you can't get a fire truck or a bus around a certain corner. You've, you've limited certain things that you can do. So um, uh, in, uh, keep, in Playa Vista, that was an issue. They wanted to narrow the, the streets more when they were designing it uh, in some of the places. And it turns out that it was actually uh, the fire uh, officials have said, no, 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 we've got to widen things, can't have these, these sharp corners like this because the, uh, the pumper trucks can't get around in case there, there's a fire, and it's the same with, with, with buses as well. Uh, what else? So this goes to your point, is that if you have consistently have problems with, uh, with traffic backing through intersections, or you consistently have problems with railroad crossings are not such an issue in West LA, but are the bane of transit planners uh, trying to stay on schedule. Because out in the Inland Empire, for example, we have a lot of uh, these freight trains that will be hundreds of, of cars long, that you know, a bus will be on time and then the gates just come down and they'll sit there for seven minutes waiting for the, the train to clear. And then as it's about to clear, one comes in the other direction. And you can be there for 10, 12 minutes and you're, you're, you're the, then you have two other buses in the queue behind you if, they're, if it's rush hour or something like that. It creates problems as well. So that's, and, and in some places I know they'll actually avoid a, a, a surface crossing so that they can, they'll go a, a, a less, a much more circuitous route to avoid the, the uncertainty of those railroad crossings. Um, this is a really tough one, and that was the example I gave. I mean, UCLA is a perfect example of that. Um, if, if you're building a subway down Wilshire Boulevard, what you'd really like to do is have, have uh, Wilshire Boulevard run about, uh, you know, between the, the, the police department and the hospital at UCLA, that would be fantastic because you could just get off the subway and walk to almost any destination on campus. Now, people are going to get off that subway and now you have up to, how far is it from here? It's almost a mile actually. Yeah, it's almost a mile. It's a long walk and it's uphill. And so then you have to transfer and what do people hate to do? They hate to wait and transfer, right? So that's that's sort of a dilemma. But then when you make that turn and go into that big traffic generator for all the through traffic, very frustrating for passengers. They'll they'll make like a four or five six minute diversion. Then they come back and they pass the point they went by six minutes ago. And you'll actually see in some places people with frequent services they'll get off there and run across the street and wait for the next next bus to come along as they're trying to move along. And that's really inconvenient for travelers. So it's a, it's a tough trade-off. What would Jared Walker do? Uh, 
deviate. He wouldn't deviate. He'd say, get off and walk. Um, let's keep that thing moving through there. But it's a, it's a real challenge. Can I ask a question about the railroad crossing? Sure. Um, you might not be able to answer. Is there like a, uh, like a cascading effect on traffic? Let's say the expo line. The, 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 now that the lights, now that there's such a long wait there at... Overland? Wherever. Does it have a, like, the effect a half a mile up on other cars? Like, have there been studies on, like, people having to wait X number of extra seconds a day after an expo line is in a certain, like, like a mile, half a mile away? Uh. I, I, I know I know this generally the the, the, the latest on this in, in general the, uh, the sorry uh, the uh, things like the expo line drive the traffic engineers crazy because what they're trying to do is optimize movement around the network and there's sort of regularized flows of vehicles so an event ending at Staples Center or expo line or Duff, difficult because it just throws this thing in and it throws everything out of whack. They're trying, as I understand it, to know the real-time schedules, and they try to do what are called sort of upstream and downstream adjustments. So, for example, if um, in, in, in the, the expo line on Oberlin will do this, is that if you are, if they know that your car isn't going to get through the crossing when the train comes down, it might hold you two or three signals upstream. Oh, another place we do it on, on Wilshire Boulevard. So that what's the busiest vehicular intersection in California? Wilshire and Westwood. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I even ask these questions? <laughs> Wilshire and Westwood, absolutely. So in California. In California. Wow. This was the 70s, 60s. Been for a long time. Why? <laughs> Have you been on that intersection? <laughs> Is it because of the 405? It's because of how wide Wilshire is. So Wilshire has a ton of traffic, but it's also four, four traffic lanes in each direction, which is unusual for a boulevard. And then Westwood has quite a bit. Westwood's not unusually high, but it's the combination of the two. But anyway, so let me, let's not get into that. I don't want to get lost in the detail of this. But the important thing about that is because, so if, if you optimize the flow of vehicles along, along Wilshire Boulevard, everything is fine because when you cross Beverly Glen, when you cross these different things, you, you can work it out, the timing to optimize the flow. But there has to be a much longer wait at Westwood because there's more traffic that's moving in and out of Westwood Village. Because of that, if they just optimized it sort of at each intersection, what you do and what you did early on is you had huge queues at Westwood Boulevard. So you'd kind of move along really quickly and then you'd be held up at Westwood Boulevard. They still have them. So, well, one of the things they do is that uh, they will know the timing of a vehicle, so when you're coming out of Beverly Hills or you're coming from the 405, it will know where you are, uh, the system, and when you're likely to pass through Wilshire and Westwood, because they don't know you're going to make a turn or anything, and in your case, it doesn't know that people are coming from other things and getting on the roadway, but it does know the vehicle's farther up. It will then hold you at intersections. So you, have you ever done that where you get kind of frustrated, like, why do I keep hitting this red light? This is so dumb. Why are they doing this? Why are they holding me up? Well, they're doing that to keep you from all bunching right at that intersection. And then, it'll, it'll, when it knows that you're now uh, you know, 42 seconds away and you're going to hit a green phase, then it opens everything up and lets you go through. So optimizing over the network is different than optimizing at an intersection. And so you will get some counterintuitive things, and, and at times the system will hold you up. So now with the expo line where it has at-grade crossings, it, it won't just wait at that intersection. It may keep the red longer two intersections away from that crossing because it knows that the train is coming through. And then when, when the train clears, it will let you go. So there is some, some intelligence to the system. And LA was, a, was an early leader in this. It kind of fell behind other cities, and, but has been making progress in doing it. Yes? And just a quick clarification question. When you say uh, busiest for, you know, in terms of route plan, but also for like an intersection like Westwood and Wilshire, is that referring to the number of cars that are moving through that The number of cars are referring to, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So, what are some basics of route design? So, one is you have to decide where the route should to, should begin and end. Uh, you have to think uh, that it's nice to end at a major trip generator or trip center because you can have transfer points there. Um, 
the bus, uh, when it's a bus, has to be able to lay over without blocking traffic. You have to be able to lay over. So you have to store it somewhere. So one of the reasons that for years we used to have a stop here at McGowan Circle, they've moved a stop down here so it's better located. I just got off there for the first time with the shuttle because my bird scooter wouldn't work. <laughs> I tried twice, it wouldn't unlock. So I've been abandoning the... I haven't, I haven't downloaded Lime. You know, Bird gave us money at our last conference and Lime hasn't. And I asked them for money and they didn't give it. So I'm, I'm trying to reward Bird for, for helping to fund our, our last conference. So, um, but I, I will download Lime. I, I, yeah, right now I'm only Bird, only Lyft. I don't, that's yeah. um, So, but you can lay over buses here. So they can hold, and there's all sorts of reasons why you want to do that. And I think I've talked a little bit about it. Um, and it has to be a safe and secure place for operators. So there's been an issue where you lay over in a dicey, you, you know, you'll pull off a major street and pull over into a dark, uh, uh, in an industrial area, and, and, and drivers can be robbed or other kinds of problems. So it needs to be a safe place there. And, and it's really important that they be able to use a, a, a restroom facility. This is often an issue. And that they'll sometimes work out agreements with grocery stores, drug stores, restaurants to allow the drivers to go in and out and use the restrooms rather than having to store that. And I think I've mentioned that. I mean, when I rode San Francisco Muni, there were a couple times where they would just stop in the middle of the street and run in because um, it's really difficult to have layover spots for, for Muni. Okay, so let's, let's do an exercise. So uh, where should our line run? First, you deter determine the path of streets you're going to go on. You determine those endpoints. So this was uh, uh, my former student, Kurt, when he was first doing the re uh, uh, revisioning, kind of came up with this. So you have their downtown transit center and Houston Community College, right? So you have an anchor at each end. Um, you create intermediate time points. So you want to say, OK, well, here are two major other stops. And the way that these time points are is that in between, the driver has a lot of flexibility on, on uh, how fast to go, how slow to go, how long. But when they get to a time point, we talked about this on, on, on fri the Friday we were there. What can't they do at this time point? Leave they can't leave early, right? So if they're behind, and now with, uh, uh, with AVL automated vehicle, automated vehicle locator systems, you can see where they are. But you don't want it to leave early. So if you've ever done that, and it's frustrating, I just wish communication is really important. Have you ever sat there and you're thinking, I need to get to where I'm going? And they're just sitting there thinking, what are you doing? Well, typically they're waiting until they're just looking at the clock. And as soon as it says 4.13, boom, they're off and they're going again because they can't, they, they've gotten ahead. I just think they can say, we're ahead of schedule. I got to hold here for four minutes and, uh, and then we can go. But so you have those time points that you work out. Uh, and that's how people know, uh, you, you, you know, when you look at schedules, you kind of know what, what it's supposed to be. And then it's how you determine your on-time on performance calculations. Uh, and then what you have to do is create running times within the time points. And typically they'll go out and, and drive through. They'll drive an empty bus to try and figure out what it would be. So in this case, you have, you know, eight minutes, six minutes, 10 minutes. So you have an overall one-way travel time of 24 minutes. Uh, and this is going to vary by time of day or day of week for two reasons. What are the two reasons it would vary? It's going dwell time and traffic. Exactly. Dwell, ooh, very nicely done. Dwell time and traffic, <laughs> the two things in there, right? Because you have a lot of passengers getting on and off, it slows you down, and if you have a lot of traffic. Um, so you then have to include the time in both directions, and it might be slightly different. So you have a round trip time of 46 minutes in this case, in this example. You still need to consider layover time. So uh, you have to put that. So you have the round trip time and the layover time. And, uh, and the layover time is, is really for both things. It's a break, but also if you're behind schedule, if you schedule things really tight, and I think that, uh, again, I think Southwest Airlines has been uh, really good at being able to pick their layover time. So I just flew at the end of the day. I had the last flight up to Sacramento in the evening on Tuesday night and the last flight back on Wednesday night. Both of them were on time. And part of the reason is, is they're really good about what's called recovery time. So if you're behind, can you then get caught up? Because if you, if you schedule it together with no recovery time, then a flight late in the morning, every single flight for the rest of the day is late, right? and you want to be able to recover. The same thing happens here. So something happens, there's a major accident, and they have to like back up and deviate around. If you don't have recovery time, 
the, the bus is late the entire day and you want to avoid that. Um, so there you work out in this example, there's a five minute layover time in each time. You have a round trip time of 56 minutes. Uh, and then you construct an initial schedule. You need to choose your frequency of service. And we've talked about that policy headways and demand driven headways. And who says frequency is freedom? Uh, it's very funny because I tout his work all the time. We argue a lot over email over things. but uh, uh, and, and that can vary by time of day or week. You need to think about connections to other routes. Uh, and you have to think about your, uh, your, the size of your vehicle. Larger vehicles will need more dwell time. Um, and then remember the span of service as well, so how long that is. So let's put a schedule together. So we're going to, yes? So I was wondering, is there, do, do agencies tend to make up for expected lost time um, on segments that are sort of notoriously or tend to be, tend to take longer? So if an operator arrives, but you know, earlier trips in the day had said that this, this particular next section is going to be very congested and going to take maybe three or four times the normal amount of time, do they let them leave early? Is this something that agencies do or are allowed to do? Yeah, so one of the things that they're, they're, they're trying to move to is when you get headways low enough, you don't need to follow a schedule. So one of the deals with the rapid is the rap the only ta time points for the rapid is that you uh, is your starting point and then it's a it's it's a drag race you just take off boom as fast as you can go and that's because if the if the frequencies are enough it just doesn't matter that much but when you're operating on say 20 minute frequency uh, you need to have uh, you know you can't have someone on a 20 minute frequency waiting 25 or 30 minutes because it's it's extremely disconcerting to the passenger so. They will, uh, it just depends on how, how frequent the service is that they, that they try and do that. Yeah? What are, so what, like the um, 720 down Wilshire be an example of a, a rapid yep. bus? And so they, how do they measure their on-time performance then? Uh, they, what they do now, see the, the world has changed a lot just in the last 10 or 15 years. They're now, they're, first of all, a lot of the stuff, this is sort of like teaching people about regression. You used to have to kind of do all the stuff by hand, and now you just need to understand it to know what the software is doing. The software is getting better, and they're actually tying it in more with actual real-time information. That goes to both of your questions: is that now, if on whatever reasons, uh, you know, again, the high school gets out and it causes a lot of localized congestion, and then there's always a seven-minute delay at 3:30 p.m. on school days they can start to adjust the whole schedule sort of in real time around that so that they can adjust and account for those things. So increasingly they're getting better at, at doing that, which I think is now answering your question more than yours. Now, yours was, say it again? How, so if the, the rapid buses, for example, don't, don't have- Oh, how do they evaluate on-time performance? Yeah. They, uh, they're able to then just follow the bus. They, what they're doing is, is if, the, if the bus drivers are going as quickly as they can, they can see how they do relative to one another and, and to traffic conditions. So it doesn't matter. All they do is say that there's this frequency, but they won't publish a schedule. They'll just say it comes every so many minutes. You can do that below 10 minutes. Uh, typically, 10 minutes and up, you know, it starts to become you need to be more on, on a schedule. So how do they know that they're doing on-time performance? They just can see how each run is, is performing in, in real time, and they can actually analyze it. And they can, they can analyze data that allow them to see how how different routes perform and how different operators perform. Yeah. So I used to take a bus, I think it was the 234 in Taipei. Um, and what would end up happening with that kind of thing is that bunching became a huge issue. You would have sort of, it was supposed to come every five minutes, but then you'd have five buses and then no buses for about half an hour. Um, yeah, so we, we talked a little bit at the, uh, well, the group I was in, I asked a bunch of bus bunching questions, but, uh, but not all of you were in that, that group. Uh, so bus bunching is a uh, is a bad thing. Buses like to get together. Uh, uh, people don't like that. And and just to, it's really important to understand conceptually what goes on um, is that if um, you're you're an operator, you're moving along, you're held up. There was a there was some somebody went through an intersection and blocked it. You were there for two cycles and something else happened. You got behind. Okay. So what happens is the bus behind you is gradually catching up to you, right? Then you go through the intersection. Now what happened is, is if we assume that people are, when you have 60 minute headways, people are very careful about when they show up at the stop. But when you're below 15 or 20 minutes, it's almost as though it's a random arrival. 
So just imagine people are randomly arriving at, at, a, at 15 minute headway, people are randomly walking into the station, right? Or walking up to the stop. And you have people randomly arriving. Now that, that bus ahead of you has left, and now instead of there being 10 minutes, it's 15 minutes. It meant that 50% more people have randomly walked up to, for you. So now you get to that stop and you have more people who are boarding. And processing their fare payment slows you down more. Meanwhile, that other bus is catching up to you. Now, by the time you leave, now it's 17 minutes between you and the bus in front. So at the next stop, there's even more people to pick up. And so you get farther and farther behind and your bus becomes more and more crowded. And then you were there waiting a long time and you said, this is supposed to be every 10 minutes. I've been waiting for, for 18 minutes. The bus shows up and then it's packed full of people. So not only did you have to wait a long time, but you're irritated that it's so crowded. Meanwhile, the bus that's catching up to you, what's it like on that bus? <laughs> it's empty, because now it's been two minutes since the last stop and there's no one there. So that's where supervision comes into, into play. And what they will do, and, and she gave that example, she'll say, they just shut the sign say, off and says, out of service. They don't, they don't uh, people can get off, but no one can get on. And it just pulls out in traffic and it goes in front of that, of that other bus. So they switch positions in the, the time. And then it tries to then get so far ahead, it can get back into the on-time slot. So they can say where it is. Well, that bus should be at um, wherever, Western in Wilshire, and you're way back here. It will pull over, and she said, that, you know, they'll let people off, but it'll go ahead and people will be waving, but it says not in service. There's people on the bus, it'll race ahead, and then it pulls back over and it gets in that slot, and then they can drop that person back into the to the previous bus's position, and then you're back on schedule. So that, that's the kind of things they do in supervision to deal with, with bus punching. And uh, that's also why um, if you have unscrupulous operators, they'll like to leave early because they like to sit right behind the bus in front of them. Because then they don't have to pick up many people. It makes it easier. So that's where, in using AVLs now, they can, they can supervise that better and make sure that there's less bus punching. Okay. Okay, so um, so we're going to do a 15, day, uh, 15 minute all day frequency. So we have those time points. We start out, first run out is at 6 a.m. Uh, then you work down. You have 6.15, 6.30, right? So you have every 15 minutes. Uh, you have your running times. And you fill in the first part of that schedule. Then you fill in the rest of it, okay? How many buses do you need? Well, you put in the layover time. And then, so what you do is this one ends here. This is where it's headed back. It's at least five minutes. In this case, I got a six minute layover. And then you go there. So, uh, oops. So now that bus finishes there and it starts Right? At 6.52, it needs at least five minutes. It starts here. So how many buses do you need? One, two, three, four. So you'd have to have, on this example, you'd have to have four, four buses operating simultaneously on this. A longer route, and this is just a simple example, but it gives you an idea of how you then, you can then fill out the schedule. So you can finish that schedule, and then you can assign it to the bus operating facility and they're gonna, uh, they're gonna calculate the deadhead, right, which is the time out from the yard and back. They're gonna make sure that this type of vehicle can be maintained at that spot. Um, and then they're gonna, they're gonna uh, run cutting is when you then take that and you slice it up into blocks of work. So they have to take all of that and try and make eight hour shifts out of it if they can. Right, you wanna minimize overtime and you don't want someone to finish. So a bad thing is if someone finishes after six and a half hours, but the next run would require an hour and 45 minutes and you're paying them overtime. So then you try and figure out, well, can they then, can we move this bus over to here and do a 45 minute run around so that you can try and fill in a schedule. And then it'll have these pieces of the schedule and then, and then the operators bid on them. Um, so that's called rostering and it's basically taking those daily work shifts and you combine it into a, a week's worth of work. Okay, so then uh, you can then calculate costs and the impacts. You can use uh, average, almost always, rather than marginal. Um, 
and they look at the effect of the new service, you confirm that you have the vehicles available to operate that service, and that's not always so easier than said than done, because this will happen that you have, uh, I gave the example, and I was wondering when this is gonna come up in the Metrolink example we had, is that when they were doing some of the first natural gas buses, I mentioned they had a lot of reliability problems, and they wouldn't have enough operating buses to, to basically fill out the schedule and operate the fleet. So they, they were shorting the schedule until they were able to get, uh, so they had to keep their old spares until they get things running. So I imagine that they wanted to sell off those older locomotives. I think they said with those new locomotives, they're still running the old, the old locomotive with it, right? To, 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 to share it out. Um, then you gotta make sure you got the people to do it. And it's a, it's a complicated thing. It's a big resource allocation problem. There's a lot, I mean, we're not teaching in here, but I just want to be, there's a lot of software now that aids with this. Because you can see how complex it gets. Large agency with all these schedules, how you optimize. So it's often a highly skilled, a lot of things like air traffic control and other things where people had these, these amazing uh, ability to keep a lot of, of conflicting information in their head. Now there's just uh, software that'll help them, uh, help them do that. So, okay, so here's some other issues here. Um, there's short turns, we talked about that. So it, uh, it doesn't go all the way out. And then it turns around and goes back. That's really good for, uh, for resource allocation, but what, it really, really irritates and confuses someone who was trying to get to Houston Community College. And they didn't look at the sign that said, the, you know, the 31 AC-W only goes to this point. Um, you know, it can, it can better match resources and supply and demand, but it confuses customers. So what did they do in Houston to these kinds of routes? They got rid of those. So they, they went after trying to simplify the route network. So you can see over time it's a very logical thing, but that's where you get more and more complex systems that are harder and less legible for cons consumers. It doesn't seem like it that smart because most of the time the end point is something that's really popular. Well, um, a, a better one, he, we're just sticking with this example, uh, let, me, oh, let me pull back, is um, a classic thing is Washington Metro. So you have a lot of density of demand coming out of downtown, uh, the, 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 the central area of the district. And as you work your way out on the lines of the suburbs, you know, you get on and you're standing, you think, oh, okay, I've just got a spot I can grab here. And then after a few stops, you have some room to stand and then you can put your hand down, and then you see, oh, I get a seat, and then you keep going out, and when you get out to the last three or four stations, there's like six people on the car, right? So what happens is, is when they operate that all the way out to the end, they're only carrying a few passengers, and then they go to the end, they turn around and come back, they're only carrying a few passengers again. So there's a lot of service that they could use that to turn it around and run shorter headways, which lowers the crowding in the center. So for operational purposes, it's a real advantage to do that, but it can be, again, be confusing. And people get confused, like, why do I have to get off to keep going in the same direction? But you can see how it's a good resource allocation issue. Um, so here's another one, uh, and Long Beach Transit does a lot of their routes like this, where they come out of the, the center, and now you have two ends out in the burbs, right? So you have your trunk line service, you have one that goes there, and another one that goes out there. So. These can both be the number seven, but it's the number seven A and the seven B, right? So it operates on the exact same spot, and let's say you have eight minute headways, really nice service out here, and then it goes to 16 minute headways and 16 minute headways out to these two things. Um, uh, the pros is that it, it allows you to get some key destinations in outlying areas without a transfer, and the con is that if you board the wrong bus, you end up Somewhere else, it's very confusing to people who aren't regular riders. Oh, and one of the questions I have, though, I just asked this, I was at an OEI meeting at Metro, is uh, there's a part of me that wonders whether all the stuff we're talking about here will become out of date soon. In other words, what we're, what, one of the problems is, is that transit is not very legible unless you know the system well. And every time if you just show up in a new city and it's just completely like, where do I go? What, what, you know, what bus or train do I get on? And how do I get on? How much do I pay? What do I owe? How do I do this? All those things. As we do more navigation, say through, through Google Maps, maybe, you go, maybe we'll go back to these complicated things because it just says, I want to go here now. What time do I want to arrive? This is when I want to arrive. And it just says, do here, walk over here, get on this. 
In other words, it may be that in a few years, it, it won't matter that the back end, this will be all the, it is really complex because the front end is just what the phone tells you you need to do. You see what I mean? So that the navigation, it doesn't matter and it might be that you can allocate resources more easily. But what we're trying to do is essentially make the service really comprehensible to the, to the passenger. I don't know. I just, it's something I've been just thinking about, whether these navigation systems will, will make this all less of, a, of an issue. Yeah? I think good. My, my view on this is that a good analog is sort of the airline pricing system. You've got all these apps and stuff to help you here and there to say, okay, this is the cheapest way to get from LA to San Jose or whatever. But if you know the system well, I mean, there are little tricks and tips, right? Oh, Oakland might be cheaper at this time on this airline. Or SFO will be a lot cheaper if I travel, you know, Friday afternoon. Um, so I think to that effect, there will still be, you know, people that, there will still be an advantage to knowing the system. But a lot of people will just click blindly, okay, this looks like the cheapest way to get the San Jose. So, um, what, and the fare pricing, and I've got to be careful, I'll fall into my old trap, which got us here all <laughs> good, um, <laughs> to begin with, um, is, is I, I, fare pricing, I think, is a big issue because we present the, so how complicated are, fare, are airlines' fare algorithms? Immensely complex. But it doesn't matter to us. All we know is, I want to fly to Cleveland on this day. What are my options? How much will it cost? The fact that, that it's incredibly complex as to when you book and all these other things doesn't matter. What we do is we say, well, if you're a student, you qualify for this. If not this, if you have a monthly pass, but if you buy the weekly pass, if you do this, it's, really, it's very complex. We present that all to the user and say, figure it out. I think that what it is is you just you put in what you're, I'm a student, I'm not, I'm a retiree, I'm, I'm whatever. And then uh, it'll give you the best deal at the time. And you just use that. Don't figure, sh should I get a monthly pass? I think it'd be an easy thing to say, if you go over so many rides, then you get, in other words, you don't have to try and guess what your, what your conditions will be to get the best fare. I mean, it's a public service after all. They should just be able to do that. And that way, you could have more creative pricing. You could do off-peak discounts. You could do all sorts of things to encourage people to ride when you have extra capacity, and we can't do that now. And it seems to me that's something, it could be very complex at the back end, but the front end would be very clear. I need to go here, how much will it cost? And then when it's integrated, where you say, I can take uh, Metro here, I can walk up three blocks and take that, and that'll only cost me a buck and a half. Uh, this is what Lyft would cost. I could take a scooter over here. It's all presented to you with your options. It seems to me that's gonna be an advantage over time. And it will allow for more creative pricing. But we digress. Okay, so another issue is uh, this issue where how you want to allocate your service out. So in this case, this is called interlining. So you can have the bus doing that original route, but say uh, the, the shifts aren't such that, and this comes up in BART where going from one end to the other can take several hours, right, to go out and back. And you don't have enough for another shift, but that same bus can turn and do another route. Uh, and so you can do that interline. So the bus actually pulls up, the front changes, it becomes a new route. It goes over and does that. Uh, so this will reduce when you have excessively long layovers and you have, uh, you, have uh, you can even let some passengers uh, transfer between. Uh, and it can often affect on-time performance when you're moving back and forth between lines. Uh, then there's terminal loops. Uh, which sounds more deadly than I think they are. Um, and you, there's a lot of advantages to this in tight areas. Like, like in, you're in an urban area, you need to turn the bus around. How do you do that? You don't go up and make a U-turn, right? So typically you go up and you make three right turns and then a left. And that's how you get back on. Sometimes they'll do it where it just goes out of service but that's a problem as, as well, because if the line ends here, you have to go an extra block down, back, over, and then turn here to start the route again. So that's a, it's a long way around. So in this case, you can have the route actually terminate here. But it means when you come back this way, you haven't served this. You see the dilemma? Uh, and it's, you know, it's a big problem turning it around. So you have this going back. Uh, the buses, in this case, kind of counterclockwise, you can then have uh, the service go in two directions. So this is really good when you don't have any place off street to take the vehicle. Um, 
But if you need to travel around the, the, uh, the loop, you often have to wait. So you give this example. If you're going from B to A, how do you get there? Right? It's a real problem. So really, if you want to ride all the way from B to A, you get on here, you go here, you go down here, you wait, you turn around, you come back here, and you go here. Well, that makes no sense, right? But that's a problem if, if you have these one-way routes. So one-way routes tend to be problematic as well. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for time transfer. And boy, I can tell you, having ridden BART for years, I went back. They now do time transfers. So that's where, uh, essentially, though, the, 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 the pulsing will be uh, in, in uh, Calgary. They try and do this. So they bring all, a lot of buses into the transit center. They all come in. They open their doors. Everyone gets off and runs over and gets onto the other bus. And then they take off. Sounds great for transferring, doesn't it? Why Calgary? I don't know. January in Calgary. It's probably a little chilly outside. Um, it's hard to pull off. First of all, it's hard to optimize the schedules to get all the, the buses in there at the same time. And if you do that, it means you can't really optimize to anything else. And if anybody falls behind, then everybody's left and your bus arrives and then you've missed every single transfer. So it's, it's, it's hard to pull off. Um, yeah, so I've said that. Uh, so bus stops, they're near and dear to my heart. How, how, uh, how often should it stop? We've talked about this, and the movement is what? To, it's, it's to move them further apart, get people to walk farther, and make up for it by having them wait less. And the reason is, is that people, people find waiting time more burdensome generally than walking time. Because in walking, they feel like they're doing something, and waiting, they just feel like they're waiting and they're wasting their time. Uh, and where should they be located? I told you the thing about the, the near side, far side fights. Uh, and, and you can think about what makes a good bus stop. Uh, Anastasia and Marty Wax have both done, done work on this. They found that what it looked like two identical bus stops, you have high numbers of, of crimes against persons and property in one and not in the other. And they've tried to understand what, what explains that. It turns out a lot of eyes on the street, uh, no escape route, businesses active around it, all are really positive that even late at night, when people might be walking in and out of a restaurant or a store or something like that, you're much less likely to be victimized than if you're on a lonely, quiet corner, as it might make sense. So in some areas where you have people traveling at night, you may want to have the stops correspond to different, uh, different sorts of places. Um, there's uh, how important is seating? <laughs> we, we did a study, you're going to be shocked and say, why? Why do we pay for these sort of things? What we found is when you have short headways, people don't really care about a seat. When you have long headways, they care about a seat. When you have a short headway, they don't really care about that they're out in the elements. It's long, they do. Restroom, all those things. So. One thing you can do is spend a lot of money fixing up stops. Another thing you can do is just have your buses run more often. So we found that one of the most popular, we did a survey where we, we sent students out all over California. Some of them, we, we had them travel up to these various spots. And they would go and they'd survey people while they were waiting and transferring, right in the midst of it, to ask them about, how are you feeling right now about this experience? And it was, it was a cool study. We, we ended up getting like 2,300 uh, surveys of people while they were transferring. And one of the most popular stops was like, like 7th and Broadway. And there's trash everywhere. There was graffiti. And you know, your, your, your feet would stick on gum on the sidewalk. And why did people like it so much? Because the buses were just coming. Boom, boom, boom. You'd get off the transfer to one. They were at their high, the, the, high, the lowest headways. People liked it because the weights were so short there. So you can make people love a bus stop when you get off and you just get back on and, and you go. The longer they have to wait, the more they care about all those amenities. Okay. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit about the differences between, or the advantages and disadvantages of where the bus stops are located, if it's near side, far side, or mid-block? Yeah, I think I'm getting, I'm going to get to that. Okay. Okay, so uh, here we go here. So one thing is uh, the spacing, and you can see here, uh, in this, this example from Muni, the bus has made a left turn here. You can see the, the, the wires here. So a problem that you have is they have the stop here, but 
because of the angle, the, the rear end of the bus is often sticking out in the street when they get the door up to the, do you like how I'm doing the bus here? <laughs> just, <laughs> they get up there and it's then blocking traffic. So it's a, it's a design problem, right? So, it, and if they have the stop over here, the problem is they can't get out to make a left turn. So see how it's not ideal in, in either case? And this, if you have a stop too close to here, it has to actually be wider to get around and make a right turn. So there's a problem here. You actually have to have the stop a little farther back because it needs to pull out and then swing around. So it's really complicated to get around these, these tight corners. I have an ignorant question. What is the agent referring to? The spacing between the what? Uh, this is, um, uh, that's how far apart stops are. Oh. Okay. A thousand feet apart. So it's not referring to what you were talking about. No, no. Um, and it, it is, it's often, you can't just then pick because you have to go with the blocks. So you don't, you typically don't have them in. I, I, uh, there's someone down in uh, J.R. DeShazo and Suzanne Paulson here said that we needed mid-block bus stops. And they argued for mid-block bus stops because it turns out that when people are waiting at the corner, there's a lot more particulate matter that you breathe because of vehicles and it's more dangerous for your health. And there's less in the mid-blocks. They said, let's move into mid-block. They said, okay, yeah. Let's also just drive a stake through the heart of public transit. Because that means when you transfer, you'd have to get off mid-block and then you'd have to go up to the corner and then over to the next mid-block, right? People don't like to transfer now, that would be a, a disaster. So she said, well, what should we do? I said, have shorter headways, then you're not waiting that long. So my answer, if you ask me a question about transit, I have two answers. Lower headways and vary the pricing, okay? So you can get ahead on, on, on that. Um, yeah, so in San Francisco, <laughs> people, if you can't walk 400 feet to get to a bus stop, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty sad. Uh, yeah, you have to also think about a a ADA rules. So there, if there's too many uh, poles, there are other things that you, you can't come up to a stop and be uh, blocked by a pole. You have to be able to have a space to load. Um, again, I gave that example about traffic. Um, so and you have to think about what vehicle. So if you're operating an articulated bus there, it's going to have a different uh, conditions. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I think I'd mention it, whether it's a terminal stop or not. So here is a, a look at near side, far side. Just what they looked at. So, so here, it's on the far side of the intersection, right? So it's come through the intersection. It can stop fairly soon because it can pull across the intersection, be way over to the right. And then here's an articulated bus that stopped here, and it needs to have what's called a takeoff zone here, right? So there has to be, if it pulled, if there was a car here, it'd have to back up to pull out, right? So it has to have an empty spot, and so that's why the drivers uh, typically won't come right up to here, uh, because they need to get out and move into traffic. One of the things that, that's frustrating for, for operators is that they will pull in, and if there's a lot of traffic, they can't get back into traffic. So some of them will purposely keep that rear end out in order to get back in and stay on schedule. There is, uh, and I'm forgetting where, uh, there are some places where it will, right here, drop down something that says stop for bus. And essentially holds traffic for just a moment so the bus can pull out. Then as soon as it clears, it drops it back up. And I'm forgetting where I've seen that. Uh, but that's something where they'll handle. So that way, this bus is not tempted to block traffic, which causes other problems but they know that they can get back into traffic and stay, stay on schedule. So uh, the total length of this is about 80 feet, okay? Here is, oops, here is a near side stop, okay? So it needs to come in and approach and needs to move around that parked car without taking off its, its fender. It needs to get up against the curb and pull up Okay, and you typically don't want to pull up here because if it had to make a right turn, it's got to have ability to get over and make that turn. So here, it's about 90 feet. So one thing is, is it takes about 10 more curb feet for a, a near side than a far side. What are some of the advantages? Well, um, if you have some sort of signal preemption, this tends to be more attractive because what you can do is you can just pull up and when you're at, uh, you know, if half the time you're in a red phase in the signal, you're, you're discharging passengers and you're boarding passengers. And then if you can trip it when you're ready and get a green a little faster, and especially if you could get a, a Q jumper, 
you'd be in great shape. You could take off, get ahead of the other cars, and you're able to have, have good schedule, okay? Uh, the problem is, is that if you don't have any control over the signal, and if you've seen that, you might pull up here, you're taking on passengers, it's got a green light, it's got a green light, you go, come on, come on, get, get on, get on, pay, 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 pay. <laughs> then the door closes, this changes to red, or, or red, and then you sit there for the entire cycle. Okay? So there's kind of a debate about what is, what is the advantage, and it depends a lot on what the signal phasing is, whether there's an advantage one way or another being at either end of the intersection, and also how important the curb space is, right? So you've essentially lost uh, some extra curb space with the, with the near side. Does that help, Maya? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there one that's more common uh, than others, at least in California? I, I can't say. I think it's often to the, so, so this is something that is negotiated typically between the transit operator and the local government. So a, a few things about um, all of this in curb management, I think, I think we're gonna be teaching like courses on curb management in a year or two. It's, it's the hot new thing. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have a complete streets curve management thing because it turns out this is a really important thing. That, and now with people with, with, with Amazon deliveries and TNCs and all that, the amount of and use of curb space is really, really changing. Um, the, uh, the cities get to control this. So the transit operator, now in the case of Big Blue Bus in Muni, what's unique about them? They are the city, yeah. No, they're just arguing with another department. But when LA Metro is going, even with, with, with LA City or through Culver City, they have to negotiate. And what happens is, is that the, the businesses will often argue and fight. So one of the classic thing is, is let's say you decided for whatever reason you wanted to go from near side to far side. Okay, so for 40 years this was here, now you're gonna move over here. Okay, what'll happen is that the new businesses here will say, you're gonna drive me out of business. The people are going to be waiting there. My customers are going to be uh, upset by that. It's, it's, it brings the wrong element in. It's going to be a disaster. You can't do this. Why don't you just drive me out of business? Meanwhile, this person shows up and says, my convenience store depends on these waiting customers buying things from me. If you take this out, you're going to kill me. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to kill my business. So again, it's loss aversion, right? People fear their loss much more than potential gains. And so what happens is the city council says, okay, the transit planners want to move the bus stop. This person says, I'm going to be really angry with you if you move it. And this person says, I'm going to be really angry with you move it. This is easy. Don't move it. Just leave it where it is. So you just finished a $200,000 study to reorganize all your, your bus stops, and then you can't move any of them. Right? So this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, there are other, uh, you know, in some cases, if you're in a certain kind of an area like this one, you can see it's kind of a, uh, a commercial, uh, I mean, a, a, an office area, but there's not much commercial activity. In some cases, they have, in, in, in other parts of the world, they have a lot of these, where you have just a public toilet that will be, you'll arrange your terminal so that the, the operator can use it. And then, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that's, that's going on. I mean, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but uh, the, uh, the amount of information now that the transit planners, I mean, I was just, uh, again, this was uh, Kurt just telling me recently. He said, he used to, they used to go out and do surveys every so often, try and gather information. Now, he gets an alert at his desk if there is, uh, if there is a, 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 some kind of an issue where there was suddenly a bunch of boardings or lightings or a bus was held up somewhere. He knows right what it is, as the planner. Knows, or knows right what it is. They have the information in real time, and their ability to manage things is, is, is vastly different. The, the, the data they have available now to do kind of refined planning is just, it, it was unimaginable a few years ago. The, can the drivers notify a system? I feel like I saw a driver doing that the other day. Like, there, I think there was a bus in, in the way of her stop, and then I saw her do like an aggravate, it's sort of like, oh, and then like press something. And it seemed like she was notifying maybe the main system that like something was, but I guess that's temporary. I think it was, I forgot what was in the way. But. So I don't know the conversation that you had with Norma in the bus operations center. So I was, we were asking some of those questions. There's a lot of things going on here. So one is sort of labor relations, right? Driving a bus is a tough job. 
you basically are uh, you, you're, you're sort of a, a skilled manual laborer, you're a social worker, you're, you're all these things that go on, right? Because you know it's the last line of mobility for a lot of people. You have to deal with people who are intoxicated. You have to deal with people. I had a, a, I had a, a student do a fabulous dissertation, PhD dissertation, where she basically did participant observation. She rode local and rapid buses for months and recorded sort of social interactions. She was really interested in what, what explains the sort of social dynamics on buses. And um, found that, that uh, for example, drivers worry a lot about, uh, in fact, Norma gave an example of this, where they worry a lot about they're all alone, and if someone hassles them or threatens them, that the passengers are like, you know, I think, do I want to get into this to help this uh, this passenger with someone who looks like they might be intoxicated or is angry or something? You know, a lot of people just put their head down and say, please, just have this thing go away. Well, it turns out that when you do a same route for a long time, if people get on, they get to know one another. She had this thing where people would celebrate birthdays and bring cupcakes, and they all rode the bus together. And sure enough, an incident came up where someone was intoxicated and threatened the driver, and all the passengers jumped up and basically said, you know, you've got to deal with all of us. And when the whole group did, the person just backed off and got off the bus, right? But in another environment, she was in where it was a much more uh, turnover, the bus driver wasn't a, a, a familiar one. Same sort of thing happens, everyone just like looks down and says, I, I don't want to get involved in this. And so it sort of changes the dynamics of, of, of kind of what goes on. So. In terms of the data, there's a lot of concern about being able to, it's not that different, I think, than probably police with the, with the, the cameras, is they now, can, they now can watch all the time. People feel that's pretty invasive. Um, so so uh, uh, Camille noted that there would be people who would, who would, you know, there was someone who was looking for work. He was getting on every day, Sam, going to three other places to look for work, and one day he got on, he says, you know, he was short some money. He said, get me, you know, next time. And then she observed later that the person came on and said, here's for this, and I owe an extra 50 cents. So they're, they're trying to help people get to destinations. And, you know, in some ways, that driver would get in trouble, uh, in, in theory, for, for saying, just get on. You know, give me the 70 cents that you have and, and, and just get on. But that's kind of a role that they're playing. And there's a sense that by uh, being sort of watched by Big Brother, there's not an appreciation for all of the, the kind of the real time decisions they have to make out there to avoid conflict and to manage things that go on, and not an appreciation for, for how difficult the, the, the job can be. Um, and so, yeah, you can get a lot better data on that, but it's hard to know uh, whether, uh, uh, and in some cases, uh, labor will resist being able to monitor things in a certain way. So they're like, like resisting around the bus lunching. They now do a more aggressive job. I, we went and visited Norma 10 years ago. She said it's a real problem, and, and there are certain workplace rules that limit our ability to observe that remotely and, and correct it. Has, it, it, it for, in, I think the previous labor agreement, they had to, the, a, a supervisor in the field had to observe the bus lunching and then would supervise it. But if they could see it with the data through the system in the bus center, they couldn't say, hold up here and we have to do this. So over time, it's a complicated set of factors that are going together and how they manage this. OK, I think I'm almost done. Uh, so uh, there are just a couple of things to worry about. I think uh, delays in travel time improvements and capacity overcrowding. I mentioned this is a really big issue on BART, the second one right now. And of course, there's all sorts of ways that, that people have historically dealt with managing capacity and overcrowding. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so I've talked about almost all these, but yeah, I wanted to put that up there is that on urban transit lines, the bus is not moving about half the time. So about half the time, it's, it's sitting at an intersection, stuck in traffic, at a stop, waiting to pull out. And uh, so that's where you can get those big time differentials, right? Um, uh, stuff, they're, they're trying to do a lot with dwell time, being able to get people uh, on. There's a movement now with being able to use smart cards where you can do, you don't have to go through, you, I mean, you could do front and rear boarding. So one of the things they've done with, with BRT is when you pay off the vehicle, you just get on. You don't have to negotiate your payment. And, you know, how many of you have been waiting to go up the step 
and say it's raining, you're trying to get inside the vehicle, and someone's saying, oh yeah, let me see, where's my, uh, you know, I, if I could just find my, so tap cards tend to be much faster, boom, you just go through, they're trying to do that. I think I asked a question about whether, uh, I mean, I'd really like to see them be able to just use readers that as it goes on and off, it just deducts the fare, and then you can just walk on and off the system. Um, but there's still quite a ways from doing that. Um, uh, transit priority is sort of the dream of transit agencies. Uh, it always feels like it's just around the corner. Um, and I think we've already talked about almost all those. Oh, the islands and bulbs I didn't talk about. So see there where um, the bus doesn't have to actually pull over it. See how the bulb comes out? Uh, the issue is, is that um, uh, typically that will take uh, a traffic lane when you do that, right? But it can make it much faster for boarding and lighting. Anything else on there? Uh, yeah, sometimes only the bus will be able to make a turn and no one else can. You've seen those? Or only the bus can go straight. Uh, but again, someone had mentioned enforcement is an issue with that. All day board, uh, all door boarding is also a really, really popular um, uh, idea, but it's really difficult to in implement. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's articulated vehicles are most popular in the US, double decks are less popular. Uh, ADA makes it an issue, uh, and, and it can be really crowded, and it's, those are steep steps typically to go up and down. Um, and I think I've mentioned all of this. Oh yeah, so here's, here's BR, this is high capacity BRT. Uh, I think people don't have an appreciation for how much uh, can be done on this. So you can have exclusive right away, you can have transit priority, you have your own station, so you have on and off boarding. You have wide stop spacing, so you can have higher through speeds fair prepayment off and then you have high capacity vehicles and are these double arctics or oh, that's a that's a those are just standard but look at how many of those are lined up um and uh yeah and, and particularly in in mexico city bogota quito uh and and uh, curitiba it's been incredibly successful it's sort of a lower cost way of having uh, uh rapid transit um so that's it With four minutes to go. Did it. I told you I could. Okay, any other questions for the two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight heroic ones? Yes. Um, I had a question about reducing headways. So I, that makes sense for a lot of sort of large urban systems, but when it comes to like foothill transit, which is a massive narrow amount of area to cover and not necessarily sort of a string of pearls or evident major pathway. Um, does it make more sense to have a cooked spaghetti model? Or, I mean, evidently that's not the most efficient. Um. Well, yeah, you can't have you, you can't have low headways everywhere because the demand doesn't justify it. What does happen is lowering headways increases demand, so that there can be some positive feedback. I mean, I think the key out there is really to be able to use technology to reduce uncertainty. I mean, the worst thing. I mean, how many of you have been in a situation where you could say? Well, in the old days, you say, I know that the bus comes at 4.56, two stops before this one, so I have to be out there by 4.56 to make sure I catch my bus. You can do that. And, you know, I know now LADOT, you, you put in the line number, it texts you back where it is. But uh, of course, the next step, and what, what you know, Waze will do now if I'm, if I'm going somewhere, it will say, going here, you need to leave now. And I didn't even set that up. But that, of course, is a great thing for public transit to be able to say, you know, I, I'm here now, and it says leave now to go catch your, your vehicle. So I think the more you can reduce that, that uncertainty, because showing up at a stop and not being sure about when the vehicle has just come, and it, you know, if you've walked out and you've looked down, and I mentioned that, that you see it a block down and you just feel like you've been punched in the gut, right? Oh. Or that elation when you see it like a block <laughs> away, like, yes! I got, well, we can use technology to help with that. And, and where we are now is in, 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 a lot of, in a lot of European nation cities, and Australia as well, they're doing much better with next bus, better than we're doing here in LA, where almost all the stops tell you the next number seven is coming in three minutes, and the one after that's coming in 14 minutes. Um, I think that the thing beyond that is to assume that most people have mobile devices and then it's turned around the other way. Rather than say, when's the next bus coming? Just saying, I'm going to my destination and it tells you when you need to leave. Then, if it only runs on a 30 minute headway, it's not so bad, right? But technology already does that, it tells you when to leave. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the thing is, is that most bus riders 
are not using these kinds of technology. And what, what this has always been an issue is through, I just was finishing a paper, I just uploaded now, that um, um, the, the socio uh, demographics even now are still, that, that bus riders are disproportionately the poorest people. I mean, I, we just got this 2017 data. I didn't even present it to all of you. It, it, it's, it's so high. So you have, people have mobile phones, but they don't have data plans. And the issue is, is the people who need this information the most right now have it the least. So yeah, young, technologically sophisticated graduate students have that information, but not your typical bus rider. And, and sort of that's, but, but when that's available, I think it's going to have a good effect. And yeah. So with, with autonomous vehicles, um, how much more like solving of things like congestion issues will buses Assuming we still have bus drivers and we still have public transit, but people are just starting to drive in autonomous vehicles so that the, the roads are networked such that there's a lot less traffic because we have smart cars that aren't stupid and like cause accidents or they know when to um, accelerate and they know, like, so things are just flowing a lot better. That'll help transit a lot, right? I mean, I'm probably not thinking of a lot of other factors, but all else equal, like congestion will initially probably go down a lot. Well, my, my, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this at the end, but, um, and we're going to have a person who's probably been working on vehicle autonomy longer than anybody in the country, and he's going to explain that we've come a huge way in getting to the point of autonomous systems. We're still a long way off from that. We're gonna have a long transition period of partially autonomous vehicles, manually operated vehicles. It's gonna be kind of messy for a long time as we're, I mean, I just I just got a new car and it like has adaptive cruise control and lean engine assist and it keeps yelling at me to keep my hands on the wheel, but basically in traffic on a freeway it'll drive itself. And uh, so those things have happened, but what the people who do this work tell me is that the first vehicles that will be automated are going to be buses and trucks um, because of their lower speed operation and a number of other things about them. You can have bus only lanes and things like that. Um, the evidence suggests that they, they did a really cool experiment at UC Berkeley, which I hate to admit that, but they did. And, uh, so Joan Walker there at Berkeley did, did this where, I was just telling some, oh, they, they, what they wanted to do is try and replicate that experience. So what they did is the people would have the vehicle for a month. And what it, what it was, if you sign up for this thing, is there was a car with the driver 24 hours a day, wherever you were, just waiting to take you anywhere, like a chauffeur. But actually, you could call up, the, the car would come get you. And they tried to make it like, ignore that there's this person here. And they actually, I think they, they cordoned them off. And they had someone sitting there all day that could just be waiting. And then anywhere you wanted to go, anytime, they would take you. And they would drop you off. And then whenever you wanted to get picked up, they just came and got you. It turns out people really liked that a lot. Um, and we should sort of replicate what it would be like with, a, with an autonomous vehicle. Uh, students and older people uh, really increased their travel in cars a lot. Uh, and those are the people who tend to travel less in cars, because basically, there was no parking. Anywhere you want to go, hey, let's go here, sure. And then you get in the car, you say, hey, let's get in the car with me, and we can just kind of yak back here, and then it'll just drop us off. And so one thing is it makes traveling more attractive at the same time that it's able to manage the system better. So it's unlikely that, it, it, that unless we can figure out how to manage private vehicles, it, it, that autonomy could make things worse, though it has the potential to make it better. Because we still are going to have to manage traffic in some way. Some people, uh, I would call them sort of uh, kind of green techno hostile uh, sorts of people who disproportionately go into graduate plans and programs and urban planning, I think. But they'll say, oh, it's going to be a nightmare. People will be having their cars circling rather than parking. It's still going to cost to have your car moving around, right? Because it's going to wear and tear and take fuel. But uh, there is a question about if you can manage, a better way of putting that is right now, we, could, we don't have to worry about autonomy. We could manage vehicle travel now. We could price it in a way that kept things free flowing. 
And it would do two things. It would make buses move a lot more quickly and would make them relatively more attractive because it, they would be a better bargain in moving quickly than a car that you had to pay to move quickly in. And so, or managing it in some other way, but to manage it. What we do is we don't manage private vehicles and then the transit vehicles are stuck and they're always at a time disadvantage. So that's why things like bus only lanes can give a huge advantage because if you're now saying, oh, should I drive? It's gonna take me forever to get there. You know, getting across the, the Rubicon, the 405 freeway at rush hour, right? It's just really hard to do on Wilshire or Olympic. But if there was a bus only lane down Wilshire and the buses were sailing through, boy, would that change your calculus a lot, right? So it's those kinds of things. So the issue is not so much autonomy, but what it means to the relative attractiveness of the two modes. And you're right, it could, it could smooth traffic. But if it does that, it also makes driving in a car more attractive, too. Okay, any other comments? Yeah. This is actually a comment, but you were mentioning the uh, curbside practitioner, um, the curbside pos possibility of teaching class. This morning, IT put out their curb curbside practitioner manual. Um, so. Yeah, I know, it's, it's, it's a hot deal. Computer streets were a hot deal a few, a few uh, years ago, and, and curb management is now. I think, I, I'm sure I would have a lot of, I, I think we need to think very differently about how we devote way too much curb space to storing people's private vehicles. <laughs> yes. Way too much. So people are really worried about Uber and Lyft. And I, it's, it's funny, I feel like I'm becoming this like defender, but there's this hostility, oh, they're stopping in traffic. Well, they're stopping in traffic because we've decided we're going to devote 80% of all curb space to people storing their private vehicles. And if we didn't have that, we said, well, first priority is transit, second priority is a, is, is a bike lane, third priority is shared mobility modes, dropping people on and off, and then if we have space left over, we'll let people park, then we wouldn't have the problem of cars stopping in the street. But there's no place to pull over because we've decided that, that we devote all the space to curbs. But you can get revenue for it. See, you can get revenue in many ways now. So every time they, they make a drop off or pickup, you could just take a you could take a cut. It'd be seventy five cents every time they pick someone up or drop them off, and you generate a lot of revenue that way. Think about what you want to do is you want to maximize the number of people people moving through an intersection, not the number of vehicles, and you want to maximize the number of goods and people who move across the curb in one direction or another. Parking is the least efficient way to do that. Transit is the most efficient way to do that, and things like Uber and Lyft and other things are, are in between. But uh, if you want to minimize the number of people moving across the curb, a car coming up parking and sitting there for eight hours and then you get back in, you basically move two people across the curb in all that time, and that's public right away. But I digress, that's another, that's another time. Okay, all right, so uh, I'm gonna jump back into uh, new mobility uh, next Monday. Is it? The, 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 the um, two representatives from Bird that are coming to our class. Oh, the company. So we're having. Uh, <laughs> so we're doing four two. Jason? Yeah, it's on okay. the syllabus. Yeah, it's on the syllabus. It's uh, Lise Mendez, who took this class, and uh, Marla Westerville, who did not. Um, are people from outside the class? Outside yes. Okay. Uh, is that. I think that's. Those are just <laughs> after Thanksgiving. Gotcha. I think I'm talking on, on next week because okay. you don't bring. Um, so I'm sure you're all going to be there on Wednesday when I'm lunch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I would never uh, schedule.